I'm doing a kids show at six, so let's get this going. Uh, <laughs> uh, we do have a fantastic uh, uh, panel to discuss a vision of Australia for uh, 2030. Uh, look, mine just quickly. Uh, in Australia in 2030, we'll be celebrating 50 years of The Simpsons. <laughs> we'll be viewing those episodes inside our own head. Our reactions and thoughts on them will stream direct to Twitter. Our brain and the internet will be one. We'll move through the world without cash or cards. We'll just have a barcode in the middle of our head, which I'm actually looking forward to. How easy would that be, eh? All politics will be decided by reference to the people or wikimocracy. Uh, there will be no war for about 20 years by them because there'll be no longer any nation on earth without a McDonald's. One big fried happiness around the world. Uh, we have a terrific panel to gaze into the future today. I do, I do offer just a hint of warning to our uh, terrific gang of Nostradami over there. Uh, all predictions should be taken with a big pinch of hubris. I offer this insight. At lunchtime today, uh, they announced the winner of Australia's Premier Portrait Prize, the Archibald Prize. The winner is Tim Storia. It's a painting without a face. <laughs> if we've got to giving portrait prizes to paintings without a face, <laughs> hell in a handbasket can't be far behind. So let's be very, very careful. Um, now, each uh, speaker this afternoon, I think, is going to uh, have about a, a three-minute start, three-minute blast to begin with on uh, their vision, and then we'll range for a few questions and a few reactions back and forth and see how it all goes. Um, let's uh, welcome them firstly. You've got uh, Annabel Crabb there, Chief Online Political Writer for the ABC. Uh, uh, most, most, most notably in the past, she held the position of Women's Officer for the University Student Association. <laughs> that would have involved booking Eva Cox for all events, I imagine. Uh, she's won a Walkley for magazine feature writing, but she's now quit everything to host My Kitchen Rules. So, uh... <laughs> Eva Cox is a research fellow at uh, the Jumbana Indigenous House of Learning at the University of Technology in Sydney. <laughs> Eva's, Eva's been commenting on Australian life since there was any. Uh, and it's compulsory to have <laughs> Eva on the ABC at least once a week. Uh, it's a d national directive. <laughs> She's had an extraordinary life that coincides directly with all the major events of the 20th century. She's an AO and has been a postage stamp. Uh, I want to uh, congratulate Adam, Bra Adam Bant, uh, Greens MP for Melbourne, and thank him so much for his work. I got shocking teeth. <laughs> Uh, they're just appalling, and I've got two brace cases at home that, you know, we're going to have to work through for the next five years or so. So, Adam, thanks for your terrific work there uh, on, on, uh, on dental care. Adam, Adam is also coming back uh, our way, back to New South Wales in May. He's going to walk 100 kilometres through the Blue Mountains. Uh, obviously, he doesn't know that you only go to Katoomba for the Paragon chocolates, so... <laughs> But welcome, great to have you here. Uh, Rebecca Huntley is a uh, researcher and author with a background in publishing, academia and politics. She's the director of Ipsos McKay Research, author of two books, The World According to Why, Inside the New Adult Generation and Eating Between the Lines, Food and Equality oh, yeah. in Australia. Uh, Rebecca's married with a young daughter and is obviously spending way too much because one of her recent essays is about get rid of your credit card debt. <laughs> Pay it all off, she said, and we'll all, all be better off. George uh, Megalogenis is an Australian journalist, political commentator and author, senior feature writer for the Australian newspaper and regular on all the commentary programs. He's still in recovery from 11 years in the Canberra Press Gallery, but uh, doesn't seem to be doing too bad with two great books, Fault Lines, Race, Work and the Politics of Changing Australia and The Longest Decade. He's also the, uh, uh, a winner of the Victorian Press Gallery Quill Award, which is for best writing with a quill. So uh, <laughs> congratulations there, George. 
So I think we're going to uh, kick off very simply, as I said. Uh, I'll give you three minutes each, OK? And um, I don't know, I'll, I'll tackle you to the ground if you go too long. Um, so Eva Cox, you might like to begin. Eva Cox, three minutes with your vision of Australia for 2030. Right. Well, I think I'll start with a statement which is basically, those of you that might remember my Boyer lectures, they were called a truly civil society. Now I'm trying to just get a more civil society. <laughs> I think we've been sliding backwards for some time. But I suppose that's the point of my vision of the future, is that we can actually start talking about living in a society, not living in an economy. I don't know what George will think of all of this. I'm getting very tired of the fact that everybody, including our treasurer, stands up and preaches about how we're going to get economic growth. And if we get economic growth and we have more working people in the, in the workforce, everything will be all right. I thought we actually sort of worked to live. We didn't live to work. And people seem to have got rather confused. And I think particularly at the ACOS Congress, we need to actually think about what makes life worthwhile. There's an interesting essay that came out this week, or a report, from the Grattan Institute, which talks about the fact that what is really important in our lives is our social connections, is our relationships with people, is who we are, where we belong, what we're part of, and that is the society not the economy, and I suppose what I would like to see us in the next 30 years is we get back to talking about the social. That's one advantage of being really old. I remember in the 1960s and 70s, or even the 50s, I can remember back there, that we actually talked about the good society. We actually talked about the great society. We talked about a lot of things which were doing, getting the world into a better place. I want to get optimism back into it. I want to get society back on the agenda. And I think economics is boring and it actually ought to be back where it ought to be. It's based on a whole lot of false assumptions. One is we're rational. Two is we're self-interested. And if both of those are wrong, so is every other bloody equation. <laughs> Well, that's good, yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> wow, right in, right in time. Fantastic. And an excellent finish. Let's just go along the panel. Rebecca Huntley next. So, what do you, what's the question? Oh, the question <laughs> is... Um, no, uh, look, I think, I think it's called uh, Imagining Australia in 2030. And you've got right. three minutes to uh, give us okay. your... Uh, so, I, I don't believe in futurists. I think that they're wankers, really. And I think that it's quite difficult to imagine a future in which... It's very hard to really pinpoint many people, particularly in politics and business, who have a really strong vision for the future. Most of the time, in the people that I listen to and the research that we do, they regularly say, I can't believe that they're polling us to tell us what we want. We don't actually really know what we want. We don't, there are big problems facing our society. We're looking for leadership. I think I'd like a future in which... Um, we don't feel sorry for about 10 people who own all the mining resources in this country. Um, we don't feel that um, we need to keep... We don't feel that something like um, giving people money back for nannies is a really good way to spend um, the public dime. I think that would be a real problem. I'd really like in 2030, if I'm still doing this work, not to sit amongst groups of, let's say, young people who have left school at the age of 16, who are living in regional Australia, who say that they can't get a job because there isn't a bus to take them from where they live to the TAFE course that they want to do. It's something as simple as that. When they have to get on a bus to go to the TAFE course to get the credentials to get the job, there is no bus. And, of course, they, can't, they don't own a car and nobody they know owns a car. Um, so I'd really like that to end... So, I mean, I suppose what I'd, what I'd like to see in 30 years' time is kind of less of a society of um, extremely wealthy people um, complaining about how, bad, you know, how heavily taxed they are, um, extremely marginalised people. And, of course, I mean, the thing that I notice all the time about the people that we listen to is that they recognise that we aren't as badly off as other countries, that we don't have those extreme disparities of, of wealth and disadvantage of other countries like, you know, America. <laughs> and, in fact, I am cons consistently surprised, not necessarily by whinging amongst Australians, but by their kind of basic generosity and um, sense of equality. Um, but that's only ever going to be maximised if we have leaders that understand it, who stop talking about everybody's doing it tough and we should give nannies, you know, we should give people who can afford to have nannies tax breaks. We have to have a, a different kind of leadership and not just in politics because I've got to say 
politician bashing has become a national sport up there with, you know, drinking beer and farting on the weekend. It's sort of like I can't stand it because I don't actually think it helps. But I think we also haven't had that kind of leadership from the business community either and we need it. They kind of stand back quietly and hope that, you know, nobody taxes them too much. So there, is that enough? Oh, that was really right, good. Okay. That was terrific. I'm Thank down. you, Rebecca. If politician bashing is going to be a national sport, then we need a uniform for it and you know, teams, I think. Adam Bant uh, would not be encouraging that sort of thing, of course. Adam, your uh, opening statement. Thanks. Um, it, it is tough to predict the future and you'd be foolish to do it, but if I can talk about hopes, it's my great hope that in 2030 um, at this conference here in Sydney, the um, Greens finance minister will have just stepped off the... <laughs> The very fast train from Melbourne to Sydney, which will have arrived uh, in approximately the same time it takes to um, get up here on a plane, and will be explaining to you um, that uh, there are two things that we are now no longer afraid to talk about in society. One is equality, and the other is revenue. Um, I'm very concerned that equality is slipping off the national agenda. In my electorate of Melbourne... Um, we've got some very wealthy people and we've also got more public housing dwellings than any other electorate uh, in the country. We've also got more women in the workforce and probably or close to the top of the number of single parents um, uh, of any electorate in the country. And uh, I see these challenges happening day to day and I'm concerned that we're not um, squarely discussing it in the national agenda in the way that we should be. I would hope that by 2030 we have... Um, fixed the issue of um, not only the gender pay gap but that we understand that um, industrial relations laws need to put people first and the needs of people first and um, we structure our uh, industrial relations laws around that and that the question of care is a central question for the economy. Um, it is now. Uh, like the number of people who are, in, I, don't, I probably don't need to tell you this, but the number of people who are employed in caring professions um, it takes up an enormous part of our economic activity. But when you think of industries, um, one tends not to think of the care industries as occupying centre stage. And we need to shift our thinking about the economy. Um, we will, of course, by that stage have got um, dental care into Medicare, something that um, at the moment um, we, you've heard a lot from, I think, from Labor and Liberal politicians over the last couple of days, but we Greens who are sharing balance of power in both houses of federal parliament at the moment are using that opportunity to advance an equality agenda, including um, getting dental into Medicare, something we're in the arm, arm wrestles at the moment in the lead up to the budget. Revenue. Um, why won't we be scared to talk about revenue? Well, um, the social services that we as an advanced wealthy economy can afford to all our population um, require money and we have become scared of discussing how we will pay for those things. And so you have the Treasurer come here um, and do uh, a bit of hand-wringing and say corporate tax receipts have dropped off and we have to uh, uh, look out in the upcoming budget. Well, you can't complain about not enough water coming out of the end of the hose when you're the one who's turning the tap down. And that is exactly what's happening at the moment. And the government has set itself three fiscal rules, one of which is to not increase tax as a proportion of GDP to above what it was under John Howard. And, well, they're well on track to do that. As a result, we're $21 billion uh, down to begin with. And we've lost another $10 billion a year as a result of the cave-in on the mining tax. If we just got those two things back on track, um, that's $31 billion, $32 billion. That funds a lot of dental care. That funds a national disability insurance scheme. That funds the Gonski Education Review. And I think we need to have a discussion about both equality and um, revenue together. It's easy to um, talk the talk on a fair go, but there comes a time to put your money where your mouth is, and one of those times is going to be this federal budget. All right. Um, terrific. Um, can I just ask uh, all speakers, the, the mics are a good mics, so you don't need to get right up on them. You can sit comfortably, and um, then you, you won't get the, uh, the popping effect. Annabelle Crabbe, experienced broadcaster, would know that, of course. <laughs> off you go, Annabelle. I popped into more microphones than <laughs> you've had. Hot so, um, hello, everybody. Uh, listen, I'm a bit... Not that I'm ever actually disappointed that George Megalogenes shows up somewhere, but I'm a bit 
disappointed that he showed up just then because my gag was going to be that George's vision for 2030 was having arrived here by now, by then. <laughs> <laughs> but now that he's here, it's totally redundant, so uh, obviously I'm not going to use that joke. Um, we were on time, weren't we? Just. Yeah, sure. Um, so... I thought I'd choose a uh, what I think is an achievable vision by 2030, which is to eliminate loneliness by then. Um, if I can borrow a kind of a formulation from Bob Hawke, and I don't try to borrow things from Bob Hawke too often, not without giving them a good wipe anyway, but um, uh, <laughs> I think that... Um, just about all areas of, uh, of government and policy making and the sort of work that you people are involved in um, are affected just so profoundly by the technological changes that we're experiencing in communications. And um, in my vision of 2030, um, the knock-on effect of those will be to eliminate the need for any human being to be lonely. Um, I think that um, communication platforms now give a real opportunity to change um, uh, our, our idea of community and how communities gather, find each other and work together. Um, and I think the capacity now for bringing individuals in need together with the people that can help them is, um, is uh, really rapidly being enhanced. And I think that's a terrific thing. I think there are lots of downsides about this communications revolution that we're all involved in, not least for established media organisations, and I uh, freely acknowledge that. But um, I think um, uh, one of the frustrations is, of course, that it feels like you don't ever get a moment's peace anymore because you're constantly hearing from people like Ashton Kutcher and Rupert Murdoch. Um, but, you know, you're hearing from tiny people as well, and uh, the capacity, I think, for tiny people to gather together and make an impact is greater than it ever was, and that's a terrific upside to what we're all experiencing at the moment. So that's my vision. No more loneliness. Right. And uh, George's experience of Sydney, I think, today has given him a very particular vision for uh, particularly this city in 2030. Yeah, George Mandelaginas. Yeah, I'd like to see the end of that three o'clock changeover in the uh, taxi industry. <laughs> and in fact, the time I wasted on the footpath waiting for the cab, I could have given the uh, column I filed just a minute ago uh, one more proofread, so it might have been a lot better for the uh, proofread. A couple of other things. Also, we might update the uh, bio that James read out, because that feels like it was locked in uh, 2003, I oh, think. That, it's Wikipedia. <laughs> it's so yesterday. Yes. No, don't. And don't bag the economy either. You've issued the challenge and I've accepted it. OK, let's look back 30 years. Uh, 30 years ago, sorry, I'll try not to pop. 30 years ago, we were the worst of the worst in the developed world. Uh, and in fact, 30 years ago, I was 18 heading into uni, uh, thinking I was going to get a degree uh, and then enter the labour market into a 10 or 11 per cent permanent unemployment rate, which was the problem at the time in uh, 1982. 30 years ago, of course, we finally got our heads around the idea that something needed to be done about the economy. Uh, all the big social reforms of the 60s and the early 70s had yielded uh, what sort of payoff? Well, probably a little more cohesive society up to a point and then the economy wasn't working so people were at each other's throats, certainly by about 82, 83. So you do need to keep an eye on these things, even if they are uh, boring uh, textbook concepts. Economy is really human behaviour, it's just another way of uh, assessing human behaviour and when your country's at each other's throats, at, at its own throat, as it was in the early 80s, you have to want, wonder about what was going wrong. Now, what we've learnt in the last 30 years is you open yourself up, not just on social policy, but you also open yourself up to everything else that's going on in the rest of the world. So if we uh, take the lessons of the last 30, the last 20 of the last 30 years are really about fixing us up for globalisation. The last 10 years have been about whinging about the small costs, you know, things like the cost of living, as opposed to gaps between information rich and information poor, gaps between the education rich and the education poor. So let's throw forward 30 years. Uh, what challenges is the rest of the world going to throw up in the next 30 years? Well, one of the big competitions, and it's only just beginning between the US and China, is a competition for a thing I call a brain economy. And that is for the best of the best, the highly mobile global worker. Now, we've got a few of those, but most of them aren't here today. Uh, now, we don't necessarily want them to come here. 
Now, they're in the tech trade and they're in the UN trade and then there are all these other service sectors. The people who are back here uh, are living the life, are living probably the most prosperous life on the planet in any rich society. But we have to bear in mind that about a million people a year leave and the people we bring in don't necessarily offer you a one-to-one -one swap because uh, uh, a lot of the people who come here now, especially from China and India, are on their way to the US when the US finally gets back off the, off its feet, off the floor. So at some point there's going to be another competition. It's going to be another competition for this globally minded worker. Now it's not a bad one to enter into because I think we, we produce the best globally minded worker uh, at the moment, but we're not going to be able to produce them in the next 20 or 30 years if we have governments cutting back on education. Now I don't mean cutting back on spending because there's a number of economic arguments about whether you get a bang for the buck or whether you do things in another way. But the priority for national government in the next 20 or 30 years ought to be to make sure we're the smartest country on the planet. Now once you ask yourself that question, how to make yourself the smartest country on the planet, and assume that you're going to lose a lot of the people that you produce, uh, you then uh, can start to worry about the people who are still here. I don't mean the people in this room, because I assume we could all take a better job overseas tomorrow if we wanted one, but there's things keeping us here. And you know, as I say, once you ask that question about what, what makes you the best, uh, the rest of the population then gets a better hearing, I suspect. Because uh, at the moment what we're doing is defaulting. Now, I'll talk about the present day, but if we're talking about these things in 10, 20 and 30 years' time, if we're talking about the so-called values of middle Australia, which is just uh, an economic... And this is where I do agree with Eva, by the way. If it's just about the cost of living, if it's just about my baby bonus, if it's just about... Um, another colour TV, flat screen TV, you know, broadband connection. Well, no, maybe that is an important issue. But if it's just about the material stuff, uh, and if you do defer to the middle, you're not deferring to your creative class. You're also not def deferring to your problem solvers. You're actually deferring to your middle, and in the middle there isn't that much there. Because as Rebecca pointed out, when you ask the middle, what can you do to solve the country's problems, they say, don't ask me, you tell me. So anyway, that's uh, my not so obvious pitch, but if you think back 30 years, we we're in a lot worse place than we are today, so I imagine the next 30 we might do well. By the way, just a couple of quick headlines. Uh, 30 years from now we're going to need another city. We're going to need it somewhere because you're not going to be adding that population to Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane and the southeast corner of Queensland and Perth. Adelaide might want to um, come to the party one day, but that hasn't had that much growth in the last 30. The other thing to bear in mind is about 30 years from now, as the population ages, you're going to have almost a majority of Australians, almost a majority of Australians with a non-English speaking background, and that includes the Indigenous population. Think about what sort of country you'll be then. It'll be a very interesting place. Thank you, George. Terrific. <clears throat> Out of that, I think there's a few ways we could go, and I think what we shouldn't do is, is get locked into arguments about what's happening now or political statements about what, what, what's happening now. Let, let's, let's try and imagine it more. And perhaps a broad thing to consider to start with would be whether we're even very good at imagining this, these sort of futures. You know, George, when you're talking about the economic reforms of, of the 1980s, we're, that, that is a government and a country thinking about what's going to happen in 30 years' time, isn't it? If we go back further, you know, we did snowy mountains things. We did these sort of things imagining a future. At the moment, it does seem as though we worry only about baby bonus. We worry about what's a surplus in a budget right now. Do you think we've, we've even lost the capacity either at, within ourselves and at a political level to really imagine futures 10, 20, 30, 30 years out. Rebecca, you're, you're uh, eager to go. Yeah, I mean, even though I said that, you know, with the, with the people that we conduct our research with, even though they don't know the answers, they occasionally grasp for them and they sometimes come up with some interesting ideas. I mean, one of them is how do we create um, local... How do we use... How do we invest in, in, in education to create better homegrown innovation and how does the government keep that innovation here, particularly around technologies that help with climate change? So people are, uh, we constantly people say, look, we should be at the forefront of solar technology, we should be really working on this well, and we should be doing whatever we can to keep that manufacturing and that intellectual property here. We have people say, look, do we, are we really serious about regional development? Are we, because you're right, George, people just, people don't necessarily think it's a good idea to continue to expand out these cities. Um, and who's going to really have, what Premier <laughs> is going to have the, the vision to kind of establish that, but people say that's important. Mm. Um, they look at, we've got to find new ways to, to move around cities. They talk about um, incentives for smaller homes, smaller, um, smaller fuel-efficient cars. The biggest question um, 
amongst people is really what are the jobs of the future going to be and how are we training, how are we educating and calibrating the education of five and six and seven year olds to match that, as well as people who are 40 who may in fact still be working. Mm. In so you think, you think people time. imagine a future and ask questions well, about they, that they, sort they of Well, they see it in a disparate way. They think about all these ideas, but it's very hard for them to kind of bring it together yeah. into one vision. And then what's the role of government? What's our role? What's the role of... of, um, of uh, of businesses as well. Yeah. I remember we, just a couple of weeks ago in field work, one of the this guy who was 50 said, "Look, maybe there's going to be an app developed that will mean I lose my job in 10 years' time. Yeah. Yeah. There'll be, you know, a Jeff app, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and I <laughs> won't have a job. And yeah. and I've still got um, school fees to pay and all the rest of it. So yeah. you know, yeah. he can get a job making making apps. George, I'll come to you next. We'll go to Adam. Adam first. At a, at a political level, do you do you walk around the corridors of, of, of Canberra and hear people talking about things that are ten or twenty years out? Um, not enough. Uh, and I think I actually think people are hungry for it. I don't think we've lost the capacity for it, but um, probably perhaps lost the courage to do it. Mm. And um, I think that I mean, when I um, talk to people in Melbourne and, and elsewhere, the things that make people's eyes light up the most is when you say, what kind of world do you want to live in in 30 yeah. years' time? Um, Lindsay Tanner, who held the seat before me, said at one point during the campaign, a key question for Australia is what are we going to sell the rest of the world in 15 years? Now, when you think about it, it's actually a really good question. Um, at the moment, if you ask the government or the opposition that, you wouldn't get a clear answer, but there's mm. things that we are doing that could really set the economy up extraordinarily well. Um, I think people would respond and do respond really, really well when, the, when imagination's ignited. There's just not enough of it. Yeah. George, you wanted to chime in? Yeah, and it's an interesting point. Rebecca, I think it's, uh, it's possible that, that the middle uh, can perceive what the problems are and what the challenges are. But I think you, you make the point that they then defer to a leader to inspire them or to explain or to, uh, or to problem solve for them. I think that that's... Um, the difficulty we've had in our political system in the last 10 or so years, uh, and for those of you who've heard this before, uh, bear with me for a second, but the, the crowd that ended Parliament from about 1994, which was the Abbott and Latham intake, 98, which is Gillard and Rudd, even more recently, uh, Turnbull in 2004, although he did have a career outside of politics, turned up at a time when everything seemed to work all right and what you were doing was really dividing the spoils between the winners. So the voter that was driving uh, a lot of the political debates, that narrowcast a lot of the political debates, uh, was focused on paying the mortgage. Now, both sides of politics acknowledge that they lost their way in the last 10 or so years, but have a look at what's happening today. Uh, reform gets pushed uh, by, reluctantly in a way, by the Gillard government to put a price on carbon, which is clearly a future issue. And the coalition says, well, we've been out of government for about three years. We feel ripped off about losing in 2007 still. You're banging on about the cost of living. Uh, here's the, some cost of living back at you. Um, so the incentives in the political system still are for one of the two parties to drive a low common denominator. Now, what I don't want to see is a bit of real problem in the next 10 or so years and things start to break down and then you force a kind of a, a, a hawk keating epiphany. The most difficult thing Australia's got today to face is, is imagining a future from a position of strength which involves a reinvestment of some description. It's a very, very difficult thing to get your political class to, th to think along those lines because they'll be telling people you have to give up something now for an intangible benefit in the future. But if the future is troubling for people, as Rebecca says it is, um, and I've sat in on a couple of the, uh, the groups that Rebecca conducts and I have heard that people do worry about the micro but they also think, uh, they also think macro. Um, this is really where we're at at the moment. Uh, it'd be nice if we flipped governments uh, for another couple of terms before we found people who wanted to talk to the future because mm. I don't necessarily think the survival instinct in uh, the main parties at the moment is serving the national interest, which is just to win the next day's media. Yeah. Eva, what do you think? Well, I think one of the sort of problems... <clears throat> I mean, George's vision of the future, to me, seems terribly dystopian in the sense that, you know, we're sort of, again, focusing on the market, on growth, on international competitiveness and all of those things. I'm not, I mean, obviously we have an e economy that we live in and obviously we have to do various economic things in order to pay for what we want. But I think we need to sort of work out how we shift the balance. And somewhere around 1980 plus, 
when the sort of neoliberal thing sort of took over as a particular model, we sort of lost the idea that we were a community. We lost the idea that we were a society. Voters became customers. So in a sense, you keep getting sold on the idea of, just vote for us, we'll give you a better tax cut than the other lot. Just vote for us, we'll actually jack up a particular allowance. So when you start treating them, people, as though they're sort of venal, self-interested customers, you sort of create a culture of individualism away from a sort of collectivist idea, away from the idea... I mean, one of the original ideas of government was that you pooled risk in order to sort of reduce the need for everybody to earn money enough to sort of pay for their own or starve to death if they couldn't. We seem to have lost a whole lot of that. We don't even encourage cooperation. Everything is competition. In this sector, I mean, how many of you have to compete for your bloody funding? Wasn't that days when I was director of Newcost, people, we, we just applied for things because they were good things to do and people funded them. I mean, there's an idea that competition is actually the way that human beings actually work. Now, there's been some interesting work done these, uh, in uh, looking at sort of different versions of people's capacities to interact. And there's much more of an emphasis these days, if you look at some of the ideas of the fact that we are collaborative and cooperative, not necessarily competitive. We're not individuals, we're social beings and we're socially connected. You know, this is coming out. There's actually, they've discovered there's an emotion called fairness. It's not a calculation, it's an emotion. And little, anybody who's had small children knows that's very true because a small child at a very early age says it's not fair. But if you create a society where people feel that the world is unfair, it is not too surprising that they then give up and drop out and do things there. Inequality is coming up increasingly as a particular issue. The world global financial crisis has proved that markets don't self-regulate, that don't work, and some of the sort of vision that George is putting, I think, will probably fall apart because we don't even know whether the Europeans are going to survive their particular games that were being played between big business and the big banks. We live in a very uncertain world, and I think one of the things that we need to do in the next 30 years is, make, is you know, get back to the idea of working collectively for the common good, of actually trying to work out how we do collaborate and how we do put issues of ethics and goodwill back on the agenda, rather than forcing on this idea of individualism and self-interest, which is the model we're doing. Mm. And that's where both of the major political parties have gone wrong, because they push on us this idea that we have to be self managed individuals that take care, you know, that provide for our own old age, provide for our own health care, send our children off to private schools in case, so that we can clear out the public schools or maybe even finding us if we send our children to public schools and we can afford to pay more, which is a totally absurd idea, you know, do you pay differentially every time you get on a bus depending on what your income was last year? I mean, there's, there's some really mad economic type, individualistic type, uh, I don't know how you call them, sort of... I mean, I used to tell my students off when they, talk, when they talked about economic rationalism. I said, it's not, it's economic fundamentalism. <laughs> There's a lot of questions. We've had a paradigm change in the 1980s when economics took over as the major thing. I think we're going to have another paradigm change. But what scares me is that what the paradigm change we get, we've got coming up could well be is something along the lines of the Tea Party and some of the sort of more loony things, where people who want emotional connections look for forms of populism, look for the sort of rise of the strong figures, look for the sorts of things that happened in Europe in the 1930s, because they really want an image of themselves that has an emotional, relational aspect, and bloody economics can't do it. Eva, uh, thank you. Um... <laughs> Annabelle, you know, you've been doing portraits of, of our political life for, for some time now. I mean, it feels to me like there's a sort of post-Keating aversion to anybody saying a big-picture statement, to anybody standing up in political life and saying anything other than, don't worry, we'll deliver something that's kind of quite good. Well, I think that's because the political system at the moment, and I don't think this is actually a permanent thing, it's just um, in some ways a reaction to the circumstances we've had in the last 10 years, which is this sort of totally miraculous terms of trade, which has actually altered the way that politicians do business, I think. You know, like, once you've got this incredible influx of um, company tax coming in um, as a result of a um, uh, commodities boom, I mean, if you have a look at the terms of trade graph from about 2001 onwards, it kind of goes like this. Correct me if I'm wrong, George. Yep. Straight up. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
I, I defer to my graph assistant. John, you're back a journalist. Sorry. Um, <laughs> better than the so gold rush, actually. How does that change the way politicians lead and think about the tasks ahead of them? I mean, politicians are humans too. They don't do hard work. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, if, if there's an easy way out, we will take it, right? I mean, that's a human thing. You don't do a hard thing when you can do an easy thing that seems to make people happy, right? And if you've got this um, incredible national income, then you use it to give people what they want, you know, which kind of, I think, ex um, explains a lot of the budgetary measures employed by the Howard Costello government. And, you know, there are plenty of arguments for why that was reasonable at the time. Um, but what it does, I think, to uh, politics is de-skill it, if I can use that dreadful word, um, in a very precise way. That is to say, stop leaders being good at what they should be good at, which is the art of convincing us of the merits of making a decision now uh, that may be difficult in order to um, create a, uh, a much better benefit down the track. You know, that is, that is what being a leader is about. I think it's, it's the central art of being a leader. But the thing I just wanted to say, it's interesting, I think there is, are cases where people don't always buy that I'm just going to give you this stuff mm. to make you shut up and go away. And well, the 2007 is a reasonable example of that. Yeah, and, mm. and the baby bonus was a good example. I mean, everybody in... Uh, when we would talk to people in our groups about it, they would say, I took it, but it was a really dumb idea. Mm. Mm. I didn't need it. Is the same, isn't I it? actually would prefer that you invested that in, a, in, a, in, in the primary school I'm going to send my kid at. So mm. sometimes it works, and I think, I think it's, it's starting to shred that view and... Um, and I also think that we are getting, we're getting quite a bit of nostalgia in our research for the kind of, well, you'll be shocked, the Keating-esque, the mm, Kenneth esque Sort of hurt me in a good way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I know. The, the, the vision, the it's the kind of the big yeah. daddy. It's the, it's yeah. the disciplined daddy you view. You are terrifying me. <laughs> the disciplined Stop daddy talking. view of politics, <laughs> which is a kind of authoritarian He's going to find well. out he'll be making a uh, comeback. <laughs> <laughs> One of them will, or both of But I what is... Sorry, go I, on. No, I... I I think, it go, I think it's more than just that there's been a period of um, uninterrupted prosperity. I reckon it's, it's probably about 30 years old, at least the problem, and I think probably you can trace back to then the time when there was when economics and politics mm. inverted mm. and it, the order of which was more important yeah. and which actually ran the country. Um, and it became the case that both... Um, both of the old parties decided that, that what politics was about was, well, we've got this crazy thing called the economy in a terrifying globalised world. The best thing we can possibly do is we can't possibly think about controlling it, so we'll try and manage it and minimise the damage. And it really narrowed the scope of what was thought to be collectively possible. And so now um, we've, we've kind of... I think this is just a logical consequence of that, where we've whittled away the idea that politics is about saying what kind of society do we want. Instead, it's just a, a tight exercise in who can manage and cause the least harm. But I think that the, um, that the space... Um, the, the depth of vision, I suppose, in politics is, has... Um, has become much more shallow mm. because the cycle in which yeah. you're assessed for what yeah. you've done and what you've, what you've decided mm. has just... I mean, it's shrunk to two weeks, basically, a news poll cycle. And, and look, this is yeah. not yeah. the fault um, of Australian leaders and politicians yeah. exclusively. It's also the fault of us and the media yeah. because we, we feed on opinion polling just as much as politicians um, do. And, and I think that it's so ridiculous to think that you could assess... Um, a long-term plan, um, you know, after two weeks. Well, that was rubbish, let's bin it. You know, nobody likes it, move on. Um, and yet that happens quite a bit. And sometimes, um, you know, and I say this knowing how culpable those of us in the media are too. I don't, I don't shy away from that. But sometimes I think, um, you know, I hear myself wishing that politicians would just not take it all that so seriously, just, you know, Barge on and do what you want to do. If you think it's right, if you think it's right, if you really think it's right, then you should think it's right enough to be worth taking the risk that other people won't agree straight away. You know. Mm. But I mean, but the um, <coughs> Eva, if I, if I can interrupt, um, let, let's uh, let, let's just refocus the, the the conversation a little. Something that came up through all of your opening statements was inequality mm. and mm. a more equal Australia. This is what Wayne Swan said here yesterday. Let's share the wealth. Let's let's try and have only more. only if you're a working person. Only if you're a, working, a, a paid working person. Yes. Sure. Um, but let's let's sort of imagine. Can we imagine a more equal 
Australia in 2030? Can but we imagine? Are there, what needs to be done between now and then to have a more I, equal what? Australia? Do you see that kind of thing happening? George, you've been, been quiet for minutes now. Quiet uh, for minutes. Um, yeah, one of the cabs I caught about an hour ago probably just turned up. <laughs> um, <laughs> More taxis for George, I think, is quite... Yeah, yeah, that's, 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 similar that's equality on that. I think, I think um, again, if we, if, if, if we use the last 30 years as a bit of a frame of reference for the next 30, um, one of the things we learnt by the start of the 80s was the uh, particular model couldn't keep majority of people in jobs for a long time. And uh, the last 30 years, the big demographic change of the last 30 years is, A, the participation of women in work, and, B the increased casualisation of work, not just through increased female participation, but also for what's happening to male work. Yep. And uh, less than half of all the jobs in the economy today are to full-time male workers. Now, that starts to create all sorts of problems uh, all the way through your society. I mean, for the, for the able-bodied boys who don't have an education, they do get to go to WA for a couple of years and do get to earn more than pretty much any, any, any established citizen in WA on arrival. Um, those who don't have, you know, the physical uh, uh, capabilities to work in a mine, and who don't have education, so I, they're on the on the on the disabled part, or whether it's mental or physical, uh, are still living in country towns, uh, living in the sort of poor suburbs of the capital cities, and no one knows what to do with them. And in fact, the participation rate for men without education without, um, without uh, having completed Year 12 has actually fallen in the last 10 or so years whilst our incomes have been rising, whilst general unemployment has been falling. So that's a particular, that's a particular issue and it's a very, very difficult one to think your way through because behind the tariff wall you could find jobs for a lot of people that didn't really do anything for them in the long run but whilst they were at work a whole lot of other things were happening for them which sort of kept them connected. So that's one problem. The other problem, if you think about the demography and the way it's been operating, it's the way it's been working, in a sense, against this idea of an easy cohesion, and that is the rise in the number of uh, sole parent households and also the rise in the number of single people households. And when Annabelle talks about the end of loneliness, that is a, a, a terrific thing to get the body politic to think about because it's sort of beyond left or right. It's actually intuitively a very human thing to think about and uh, many of the ideas, if people can frame these discussions this way, many of the ideas won't have had any pre-existing political ideology to warp it. Um, so these are, I mean, I don't mean to break the men and the women up, but what we're actually talking about are men and women who aren't together in any connected way, not just in terms of relationships, but when we talk about sole, a single person household, sole parent households, and also that male who doesn't have a part of the mining boom and won't have a part of the brain economy. Huge issues. Uh, and imagining a future where you could reconnect all those people is, is actually, for me, unfortunately quite troubling, because I can't imagine it. But confronting it may actually lead to some problem solving. I'm not quite sure. Like, it'd be great if somebody could hit on the idea in the next couple of weeks, but yeah. that's not the way the society Adam works. Adam Ban, what, what, what do you hear that gives you hope that we'll be a more equal Australia in, in, in 2030? Um, one, one of the things that hasn't been spoken about but is obviously going to be very relevant to where we are in 2030 is climate change and whether we've got that under control. And that's going to play out in a variety of ways um, and it's going to potentially impact on the poor the hardest. And um, one of the most exciting developments that I see happening in my electorate and seeing elsewhere is um, people taking on what is a, a national and a global challenge um, and saying, well, we've got, we've got two ways to go. We can either go down a very dismal route where it's going to be a very grim future or we can actually start to reinvent forms of community that perhaps we might have forgotten. Think about how we can all work together on a street to share what does it mean for, say, instead of all the public housing tenants sitting in their own little boxes in 30-odd degree heat, 40-odd degree heat, suffering from heat waves, um, how can we get everyone together in an air-conditioned space and so on? And um, I think confronting what is ultimately an existential challenge for all of us and thinking about how we respond to it, um, perhaps perversely, perhaps not, has um, some enormous opportunities for strengthening democracy and community. And I'm pretty in inspired by that, especially amongst people who are under 20, 25, they mm. kind of get it. Mm. And about we don't, we don't hear political discussion around loneliness. Like, I thought it was a startling, <laughs> a fantastic thing to bring up. Suddenly, yeah, let's have an emotional discussion instead of a, an economic discussion. 
Um, yeah, uh, Lindsay Tanner did it a little bit, actually. I don't mean to embarrass Adam. I mean, <laughs> we're all here talking about Lindsay. And, but not that Adam isn't a very precious and valued <laughs> member for Melbourne. <laughs> but he, um, I, he wrote uh, a little book about that. I just can't quite remember what it's called. But it was mm. about um, uh, dealing with people's distance from sometimes their, even their own families, you know, um, um, separated families and so on. And, you know, I think that there's such a scramble in politics to answer the voices of people who are um, the loud voices that, you know, there isn't time um, or uh, sometimes inclination to, to listen out for the people that you can't hear, you know. Um, and uh, that's what I think, you know, I think that there are all sorts of factors that feed into inequality of, um, um, of amplitude, you know, of your voice, right? Some people are silenced because they are uh, distant, you know, because they live in isolated towns and, or regions. Some people are silenced because they don't, they're not plugged into all the, all the activities and things that um, uh, the more advantaged in this respect people are. Um, and I, I do think that, that technology has the ability to get those people um, and, and find them. And I, I think, you know, I mean, I grew up in a country town and I think uh, we've probably all met people who um, grew up in an isolated area and were different because they were gay or because they, you know, were really interested in antique harpsichords and nobody else was or, or something like that, you know. And um, one of the great things about um, this technical revolution that we're all experiencing that I find, you know, that I think about that makes me happy is thinking that there are young people who are geographically isolated who don't feel as though they're the only gay in the village anymore or whatever, you know, that you can actually um, find people um, electronically who might be on the other side of the world and you can um, talk to those people and, and, and not feel so isolated mm. and um, you know, uh, I think we all worry about um, terrestrial communities and why aren't we all friends with our neighbours anymore and, and all that sort of thing. But I don't think we should ignore um, these sort of super ter terrestrial communities that mm. build up. Rebecca, do you also find when, you, when, when you're talking to people, and, and you know, I find this through the extraordinary research of talkback radio, um, <laughs> people are, it, people are quite connected, but it, it's, it's a good one. You know, you get, it's, 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 only as, it's only anecdotal, but people are quite connected. You know, people ring in all the time with stories of the connections in their streets and their neighbours and their friends. Yeah. You know, we, can, we can exaggerate the, the distance that, that exists. We can, and I suppose I was thinking if, if there was one thing that makes me confident in the, in the stories I hear today and about a kind of a future world would be one in which... Um, we didn't have either a lot of people massively overworked and a whole lot of people right. with no way into the system. I mean, it, it, what interests me now is that if you go back to our research 20 years ago, it was primarily women talking about part-time work. Mm. Now you get 40-year-old men, 50-year-old men, 60-year-old men. You get people across the life stage saying, if I could find a job that I could do three or four times a week, it was, it was permanent part-time, then I would really like to do that because I am sick of slogging myself for five or six days. But if I feel if I go to my boss and say, I want to pull back, then I'm not wanted. And in fact, then I've got to live on this kind of shift work, casual work. Mm. And, and, and I think if that happens, you'll get people wanting to, playing a bigger role in their community, um, in the kinds of community organisations that they, or their local school. And you'll get that that technology connection, which is so important, kind of actually facilitated by actual face-to-face -face connection. I mean, that is the biggest, mm. the biggest concern, one of the bigger concerns across life stages, which is... Uh, and, and it's been exacerbated by the fact that you can sog your guts out now and you're actually not going to get a bonus and you're probably mm. not going to get a pay rise because mm. you're not in that class of people that gets a pay rise when the economy is down. Um, mm. So why am I killing myself for no extra money at yeah. the end of the day? Eva, we're, we're, you know, with, with a bit of luck, we might get a national disability insurance scheme. We're rolling out something like an NBN. There's, we've had a consequent report saying let's spend a lot of money on education. If these sort of things came into play, we'd be looking at a very excellent and equal society. Wouldn't no, we? we wouldn't, because we've just had a session on one of those that you missed. But what I'd quite like to do is... <laughs> doesn't work that way. Right. Uh, but I'd really like to pick up on what Annabelle, what the three people were saying, because I think that, that in that we've got the seeds of what we're really looking at which is, yes, we need to get more involvement. We can use the technology to get more involvement. 
One of the big things we've got to do is get away from the idea that paid, fully, full-time paid jobs, I mean, here I'm putting on my feminist hat and my sort of working in Indigenous areas hat, because both have given me a much greater perspective on the importance of social life, relationships, you know, responsibilities, mutuality, all of the soft end of things that tend to get ignored in the more macho sort of, you know, work, if you don't work long hours, you're not a serious worker. And I think we need to get to the point where, people, you know, where jobs do get broken up much more, where we can use technology to work from different places. I mean, presentism isn't really so important when you've got an iPhone. You know, whether we can actually, where, pe where unpaid work, caring work, community work, creative stuff is valued in varying ways, which isn't just that you get paid for it. I mean, you look at young people who do go out, some of the people George is talking about, get them out there, you know, making their own videos, making their own music, making their own stuff there. There's a really strong potential for creative and other things, for taking care of country, for a lot of the sort of green stuff is going to be quite small local project stuff, farmers' markets, collective work at the local level. It's moving away from the idea that the big stuff's the only thing that really counts. And yes, you'll have the big boys still running around sort of doing their international you, you, hoo-ha stuff type things and hopefully producing some money to pay for some of the big stuff. But I think what, you, what you're actually looking at is how do we create a seriously mixed economy society where we put a value on people's social contributions, not just their economic ones, and work out how we actually redistribute you know, as people are saying, you know, as, as Rebecca's saying, how do we redistribute paid work so there's enough money coming in for costs? And how do we make sure that there are collective provisions for the services we need so everybody doesn't have to buy them in the private market so we can afford to work for lower pay rates and make things go around? Then we'll get a more egalitarian society. And then we might actually live in a society where we all have time to do the things that we want to do. Mm. And maybe if we took away some of the superannuation tax concessions, we could actually pay for some of these things. Mm. Adam? Yeah, yeah the, I think we have to match, get much, much better at matching the hours that people actually work with the hours that they want to work. Yeah. Because you've got... Uh, I've, I've got a bill in Parliament that just was in an inquiry a week ago um, that would give people the right to request flexible working arrangements with a much um, uh, easier access to that if you're a carer, and that's the reason that you're that you're asking for that. Uh, now, of course, there's lots of there's lots of problems. Well, that's right. So there's lots of there's lots of problems that one has to be um, very acutely aware of, including making sure that people who end up doing the caring don't work their whole lifetime on a lower wage and then find it, it hits them come um, retirement. But uh, I've just, I was astounded at the at witness after witness, with the exception, as one would expect, of the Australian Industry Group, pretty much everyone else fronted up and said, this is great, all the research says that 60% of people feel time pressured, but also, importantly, there's about 25% of people who want to work more and who aren't getting the opportunity to mm. work more. And mm. I, uh, it's such, a, it's such an important... If we talk about real equality and people being uh, able to have a proper life outside work, I mm. think it's a big nut to crack. We, we, we want this, but does it sound any different than, you know, the, the, the great Jetsons-type future that we'd all only work sort of three days a week and have, have lots of leisure? We were promised that, weren't we, that there'd be lots of leisure? That was one, one of the fantasies <laughs> of the 1970s. <laughs> what's the difference between that, the fantasy of the 1970s, that that's what the future is going to be, and the future that you're, you're describing now, that we'll work three or four days a week and that'll be enough? Well, I think the problem was that somewhere along the line we sort of lost sight of that sort of thing because it was a bit like the paperless office, you know, mm. that was also a promise of the 1970s. I have a paperless office. You've got a paperless office? Yep. Yeah. I never print anything. Right, but I mean, most people still are drowning in paper, in various mm. things, or drowning in the technology that's trying to sort of replace mm. the paper where you can't find anything. They're usually trying to fix the printer, really, is this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that somewhere, somewhere between the 70s and the 80s, we sort of moved into that yeah. much more economic sort of push, big company, big start stuff, and, you know, much more emphasis on the workforce. Mm. Mm. And well, that's why I think we need to sort of actually get back to the idea that we live to, you know, that, that, that life is a complex yeah. con collection of things that we do. It's not just having a paid job. Annabelle? I, um, I, I want to make another point, but in, in the meantime, uh, Eva, let me tell you that the main tip towards achieving a paperless office is be incapable of clearing a paper jam. That'll yeah. fix it right up for you. Um, but look, um, I've, got just, I've got a vision, which is why don't we um, 
declare a quota system, a gender quota system on the um, occupation of wife and homemaker. <laughs> um, I reckon that if we abolished this insane assumption that still seems to accompany us, that there is something abnormal about men who take time off mm. to care for their children, that would get us out of a whole lot of holes. It would get us out of um, the whole of women who are currently running around and using their brilliant workplace flexibility to work, you know, 22 hours a day instead of the normal yeah. amount. And, um, you know, fathers who silently wish that they saw more of their children but feel unable to um, make yeah. that happen because of these stupid assumptions. Mm. I mean, like, it seems to me that we've kind of achieved half mm. of um, the structural and attitudinal reforms about getting women into the workplace, but allowing men out of it for a bit isn't mm. something that we seem my, to have sorted out. My experience out. is that Australian employers are really conservative about mm. part-time mm. work, mm. about um, what flexibility... Flexibility is what you give a woman when she's just about to drop a baby on the floor. Mm. <laughs> like, oh, you give her a week off. But one, one yeah. of the interesting points that people so keep forgetting is part-time workers are actually more productive per oh, well, hour yeah. than full-time workers. Can, can I, yeah, exactly. But, and and, and I they, think don't, they ignore it, yeah. Also that sense of, I mean, you talk to men... And, see, this is, this is about employers. And when, when, of course, we've seen what's happened since the GFC, it's pretty clear that employers are thinking... Well, we're just going to work the full-time workers we've got more. Mm. We're going to give them iPhones so that we can email them on a Saturday afternoon. Mm. And, we're going to, and then we're going to have this flexible workforce, you know, and people on contract and all the rest of it to deal with that stuff. And we're going to cut down on permanent part-time because we don't think we get value from them. Mm. And, in fact, you actually do. Mm. Yeah. The evidence is that men get knocked back more frequently and actually... Absolutely. And mm. all yeah. the evidence also is that, therefore, they're asking less. Yeah. Exactly. And, they f and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's as simple as... I remember when I um, told my employer I was pregnant, we had a big conversation about what I was going to do, and I, when my husband told his employer, I said, what did he say? He said, yeah, good on you. <laughs> that was it. That was the only conversation. There was no conversation. And I waited and waited, and like literally a week before the baby was born, I said, Has he said anything to you about if you're going to take time off? Does he know the baby's coming? He said, He's in engineering. Right? It's, there is that kind of conservatism. And men themselves mm. know that, and they feel that if they front up to an employer and say, I would like to do this, this switch goes on in the employer's head. Oh, he's not as ambitious as I thought he was. Mm. Maybe he doesn't want to work here anymore. Maybe he's we need a We need a men's liberation back. movement. Oh, you know, I mean, you but it's, it. the men, it's the men have got to stand up and demand it. Like, we, we're sort of, we're all timidly saying, oh, I couldn't possibly go to the polls. <laughs> But the point about it someone's is gonna, the, 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 women, the, the women who do actually sort of take the part-time jobs then do find themselves yeah. in the lower track, yeah. so we need to still fix that one. In, in the time remaining, I'm thinking that in a, a perhaps you know, 10 minutes or so, let, let's see what's, what you want to ask or anything that you want to bring up uh, along this line of Imagine Australia in, in 2030. Can we just spend such five minutes just thinking culturally? You know, like what sort of nation are we going, going, to, going to be culturally? Like it seems to me that, uh, you know, I grew up through a time, and, and most of us did, when we were really anxious about creating an Australian identity and we made these great Australian films and we had Aussie bands in, in every, every corner and we, you know, we wanted to get Australian dramas on telly and we told, you know, we, we, we seemed to be, really that was a thing that we did and we were very proud of that sort of thing. I, I wonder what we imagine Australian identity will be, identity will be in, in 2030 and I... I honestly have come to a point where I go, well, I can't imagine it because I'm not going to be making it. It's going to be a whole generation that I don't even know that are going to make that and, and forge a whole new notion of, of Australianness, you know, coming from a completely different background from, from my sort of background. What is the sort of culture of Australia of 2030 going to be? Is it going to be somehow unique or will even that sort of notions of national uniqueness have kind of disappeared? George, what are, what are you thinking along those lines? Uh, well, I, mentioned, I mentioned earlier it was more uh, a sort of like a, um, a dot point, but I'm glad you picked this point up because the because the way the um, the way the uh, population growth and immigration rates are moving now, and the source countries we're re receiving immigrants from, I think the last calendar year was the first year on record where someone other than the British were numerically the number one entrant. And that was the Chinese. Mm. Um, as I say. By about 2030, you're going to have uh, close to a majority of Australians with a non-English speaking background. I, from a country overseas that is not the UK or uh, South Africa or New Zealand, or a parent, or you're Australian born or a parent from one of, one of the non-English speaking countries. Now, I think for the national mind that if you, if you 
if you did Jeff Blaney style, did the numbers on Asian migration in the 80s and said there's no way Australia would be able to absorb all these new people. Well, we know 30 years later we did, and there's still a sense of Australianness. Uh, I suspect that the sense of Australianness we will have in about 30 years' time will be because of the numbers of people we have here, because we're going to be getting to closer to 40 million people, we are going to get to a size where we start to matter. Uh, in the region, if not globally. Now, medium size is quite an interesting size for us because we've never had to consider medium. We're more small, medium, uh, prosperous, like 20 million people in charge of a continent, but 40 million people not only in charge of a continent but in a position to start not dictating terms to the rest of the world but have a voice heard in the rest of the world. Uh, Bernie, uh, not Bernie Fraser, sorry, Glenn Stevens, the current Reserve Bank Governor, made a point the other day in a speech that around the world everybody wants to notice us now because of what we did during the GFC, but here in Australia everybody wants to tell themselves how awful things are. Like the one time in our history where we've actually got the global recognition we've been craving all our lives, we've got it now and we're whinging about it. That's quite an interesting little insight <laughs> in the Australian character yeah. just there. So but that's still alive, isn't it? There's a movie you know? in that, George. <laughs> There is a movie in that yeah. you became comedy. You became a nation everybody wanted to know about. And what have you got to say to the rest of the world? Yeah. No, not me. And Annabelle, do you think those sort of you know that sort of we're the underdog and you know, we're a bit laconic and all that sort of stuff is that still going to even exist? Those sort of those Hope kind so. of Australian so. those sort of Australian things that to me are based on you know a Bondi lifesaver or a stockman. Is, is that are stuff going to be a lot? Is that what it is? I don't know. I think it's a bit broader than that, isn't it? Mm. I mean, the thing that I like about Australia, which I hope is still around in thirty years is our ability to kind of take the piss out of ourselves and then to look at other countries and think, you're mental, aren't you? You know, <laughs> you know to look at, um, at a class system like the British class system or look at, you know, um, the states where you can have these incredible protests in the street about replacing a really shit healthcare system with a slightly less shit one and, you know, there are people who will go to their deaths to defend uh, themselves against having health care thrust upon them. Like, you know, <laughs> to look at that, those sorts of arguments and think, they are crackers. I mean, yeah, like, if you, tried to, me. if you tried to introduce <laughs> the Australian health care system in the United States, there would be a nuclear war, mm. I assume. And, mm. you know, we read about those arguments and think, Look at me, I've got no idea what that's about. Well, hmm. I, you know, I like that. I hope it's still around yeah, in 30 yeah. years. Adam, do you feel like you can imagine the Australianness, the, you know, what will be considered typically Australian in, in, in 2030? I hope that we've deepened our sense of localism and globalism and got rid of some of the worst potential excesses of nationalism. Uh, I just think that to pick up on George's point, um, plus when you add the massive displacement of peoples that we're potentially going to see as a result of changing climate in other parts of the world. I hope it's still uh, at the stage where banners can hang from the Fitzroy Town Hall saying refugees and asylum seekers welcome here mm -hmm. and that um, the pride is very much a local pride but it's not based around a fortress around the country. Yeah, right. Rebecca, what, what do you hear and what do you think? Uh, I, I think there's a chance it will become more nationalistic in the future but it will just be getting pissed on Anzac Day and it'll just be Sudanese people getting pissed on Anzac Day as well as everybody else. And I also hope that that oh, will that's have... A, that's a lovely by then, in, in 30 years, I think, we'll have worked through every nationality in the world and we'll be back to bagging the poms. That's what I don't think we've lost that? Do you think those kind of trades get passed on through... through I mean, I'm just sort of, I, was, I was noticing... I was noticing we, we, we drove back from, from Melbourne with, with the family, I streamed up the Hume Highway, and we drove straight past the dog on the tucker box. You don't even pull in. Shame I know. on you. Shame. And I thought, Were you on your way to another big thing? Exactly. We, yeah. wanted, we wanted to get to the big merino, you it's know. Not, it's not so a real dog. We drove no. straight, straight past it, and I thought to myself... I think they you know, moved it. Anyway. In my youth, you would, you would have pulled in and had a thermos and some sandwiches, and the story kind of would have been told, you know, like, what's this, Dad? And there'd be a bit of that sort of stuff. I wonder if those... I don't think it even... I don't even necessarily care, but I, I think... <laughs> but... No, I, think I wonder that, I if think there'll be a sort of line drawn between that old Australia and some no, new Australia. No, I, I think imagine. that you're likely to have people kind of get excited again about those kinds of right. things, and and not just people who are 
from Anglo stock across yeah. the board. But then I think you'll also, potentially, hopefully, much less likely, people will get over this stuff about boat people and asylum seekers. Mm. And so it, that nationalism, I hope, my nas that nationalism is not harmless, but something in which everybody has access to, that kind of, you know, taking the piss out of people, that, mm. that, that kind of um, um, relaxed Australian attitude. But I think there's a point where there'll just be... George is right. When, you, when you're talking about 40 million people, and if we've navigated that next 20 or 30 years without race riots, without real ethnic ghettos, without the real kind of ethnic strife that we see in the rest of the world, hopefully we'll wake up and realise we've actually done this reasonably well, mm. and let's not be worried about... 200 people in a leaky boat, yeah. you know, coming but I think, I, But I think that's a crucial question, and that's one that we really do have to address because we really haven't talked about that. You know, we still are doing abominable things to Aboriginal people. We're still doing abominable things to people from Muslim backgrounds. We're still abominable in terms of very many of the outgroups. That is something that if we want Australia to sort of maintain its sense of who it is and the pride of who we are, I think that's the sort of stuff that's actually got to be undermined and got to be talked about seriously as inclusive because the more we bring people in or have people within our own country who don't feel at home here, the less likely it is that we are actually going to be able to maintain the good parts of being an Australian and the more likely we are to sort of end up with fragments. And I think what we're doing at the moment, there's a lot of prejudice around. I mean, that's my worry. And that's one of the reasons I'm talking about the thing there, that unless people sort of can get some emotional and social satisfaction out of being seen as Australians with a very broad brief, we're likely to become insular within the various groups we are, and many of the groups that arrive here will not assimilate into the sort of into the broad into that sort of thing, and they will, and we won't recognise the sort of the strengths of the diversity. And so I think yes, we'd like you know it would be good if in the, in 2030 we could retain a strong sense of our own nationalities, but I think we've got to do some very rapid cleaning up about what we're doing at the moment to the various outgroups we have here, including you know, the people that come on boats and including what we're do, doing to Aborigines in the Northern Territory under stronger futures. I mean, mm. we are actually still pushing racism. Yeah. Incredibly true. Incredibly true. I mean, we only have to think that, like, 30, 40 years ago, we, we would have been assuming by now that the kind of... The health conditions for Aborigines, at, at the very least, would have been... We would have been, been uh, yeah. would have been been dealt with. Uh, let's become like just a, a big Facebook group, live here in the room, uh, and let's all like what's been going on, and let's see <laughs> what uh, what we want to talk about. You were straight up there. What would, what would you like to uh, comment on or throw to the panel? Uh, hello, hello, hi. Um, Jean Calderbera from Left Right Think Tank. Um, to follow on um, Eva's point just then about the fragmentation of future Australia. Um, I wanted to add to draw upon a point that George brought up with, you know, um, you, you, you just perked up, <laughs> um, mm. about the culturally, the, um, the cultural uh, diversity Australia will have in 20, 30 years. Um, I'm going to use this dirty word, multiculturalism. <laughs> um, we have, we see, we, we've seen a current reincarnation in that with, with the Gillard government last year with the Sydney Institute and with her, well, not her, her policy, it's obviously not her policy, but Bowen's policy, um, People of Australia. And one thing I've noticed after looking at the um, multicultural policies of the past few decades has been the entrenchment of the economic benefit that migrants bring to this country, mm. but yet we don't involve them in the, in the society that they have come to. So we have anecdotally the situation where I might have a very educated taxi driver. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I might have a, I might have a doctor, um, you know, Iraqi refugee, who who might have... Actually, I came across this person who apparently gave birth to a, um, gave birth to a woman. I'm sorry, not sorry, to a child. Who <laughs> oh. <laughs> Clearly, I don't, I'm not well versed in childbirth. But... <laughs> um, and he was, and was an actually Iraqi doctor. So we have all this anecdotal evidence to suggest that we have um, people coming from overseas who so are highly educated. Um, but my question is this. If we have economic policies, if we have immigration policies, if we, if we have multiculturalist policies that keep saying, yes, migrants bring an economic benefit to this country, and we don't integrate them into Australian society in a multiculturalist sense, then how do we... Exp and then what, I guess my question is, what kind of policy mix do you guys see for this country? Um, okay. To do, with, uh, to, to do with making sure we use the skills of the people who come here? Absolutely. That's yeah. No, no, I mean... Okay. I'd Respect for the different people, groups and not sort of treating yeah. them as any trash. Yes. Well, absolutely. I think I, I know exactly where you're coming from because one of the things that's... Because I do track migrants through decades. One of the things that concerns me about the present 
uh, almost over emphasis on skills and cash on arrival is that you're actually competing for the wrong global citizen. You're actually competing for the one who may well be on the way to the US. And because that's the contract, you're not really expecting them to stay. Now, let's wind back very quickly. Uh, what worked for, for the post-migration program and the refugee program of the 70s, what worked was not necessarily where the immigrant ended up on the uh, income distribution, but what happened to their kids. Because the children of non-English-speaking immigrants, Australian-born, uh, outperformed their peers. And this is, this is a stat that repeats itself in pockets of the US as well in places like California. So, Point one, if, point one, if you're looking for an economic benefit, you should really be counting it in the second generation, not in the first. Point two, what you actually get, if you're thinking second generation, not first, you'd actually be thinking lower skilled, not, hi not higher skilled, because you're actually bringing somebody here who is not only grateful for the opportunity, but is going to push their kid as hard as possible to hit the centre, to hit the national centre, uh, not just in terms of income, but in terms of connectedness, uh, now, I can say this from personal experience, but a little while ago I, was, I finally counted myself in the majority in Australia, which was quite an unusual thing, and it, uh, it's not something I've ever mentioned in a prideful sense, but it's funny having lived through this thing in my own, you know, me and my friends, having lived through this through the 70s and the 80s, and you do hit this sweet spot in the late 90s, early noughties, when you start to see the stats tick over and you get to the point, A, where the program vindicates itself through the uh, work experience of the children, but B, once you start to count all those people up, they approach the absolute majority of the entire national population. Mm -hmm. So how would you fix this? Well, there is an early, it's an early warning sign. If you've got over-educated people driving your cabs, your immigration system is actually not working. I, I think it's more than the immigration system as well, and I'm actually concerned that we... The, the Public Housing Commission blocked down the road from me. They did a recent survey of the two odd thousand residents there, 50 per cent identified as Muslim. Um, and uh, the, the unemployment rate amongst people who've come here on um, non-skilled visas and their families, um, I'm worried that it's, it's actually creeping up and that um, it's now potentially becoming... Um, generational, like these are the people who there's a smart, there's a jumbo jet pilot in my electorate who drives a cab, um, who's just the barriers to retraining are just perceived as being too phenomenal, and that has a flow-on effect because um, the the kids that I'm talking to are looking at their parents and saying, well, you've done all this study and you haven't got meaning, what you consider to be meaningful work. Why should I bother? Mm -hmm. And um, my concern at the moment is, and I think the jury's still out, is that for those who've come here. Basically, you've got black skin, um, or if you're a Muslim or um, you speak Arabic, that the, the pattern might not be repeating mm -hmm. itself at the moment, because that's certainly what I'm saying. Let's just try and get through a, a few questions quickly. I think up the, uh, up the back here. Uh, yeah, I, I actually have a, a comment as well, a question. One of the things that I've noticed, I'm a migrant, by the way, I came here in the 70s. One of the things I'd like to say is that we don't do inclusion very well. Mm. And if I look at the um, experience of recent migrants, as well as my experience, I don't know that we've actually been able to include people in a way in which we're um, valuing what they bring, but also giving them a sense of belonging. Mm. I think that the Australian ability to include needs some work. And the other is that I actually feel quite hopeful. I have two granddaughters who are Samoan, Indian, Australian, Irish Catholic, and Danish. <laughs> Where do you and put the hyphen for that one? <laughs> yeah, that's right. and if you just call them Aussie. <laughs> and if you're looking at they are truly representative of, of a multicultural Australia, mm -hmm. I think that they, for me, reflect what's possible. Yes, there's racism. Yes, they do come home and ask, Mani, is there a school for brown kids? Mm -hmm. But you know what? Their sense of self is very good. And they have very close friendships which cross hmm. Aussie, the whole thing. But they live in regional Australia. And I think that one of the problems is that people congregate in cities because they feel unsafe going outside of the city because they're not included very well. So there's some work to be done around how we include people and the ways in which we make, yeah. we make them feel belonged. Yeah. And, I'll, and maybe I'll be Tony Jones and say I'll take that as a comment. And uh, thank you very much. Although, on the, uh, on, sorry. Oh, sorry. 
Two things very challenge is inclusion. Yeah, yeah. Two things very quickly that uh, are, are going to assist inclusion. One, the bush needs people, and the most interesting thing I picked up in that 17 days we're waiting for the uh, hung parliament for Windsor and Oakshot and Co to decide who'd be prime minister. Tony Windsor kept saying. We're not afraid of uh, population growth. We need people. So the bush is in a... And it's been an interesting place for the last few years. So you may have a situation, if you, if you get your immigration intake right, where you start to put people straight into the place where you think prejudice is highest and they'll be welcomed simply because it's an economic survival thing. Mm. The second thing is one of the things that's... You know, where the prejudice leeches in Australia in the political system comes from Queensland. The Queenslanders are losing so many people now to WA that they're going to have to import non-English speaking immigrants basically to maintain their population and economic growth and when Queensland changes, I, when it catches up with New South Wales and Victoria, then we may not have to worry about these yeah. things at a political level. And I say that as a, de as a demographer, not passing judgement on Queenslanders. All right, uh, on the corner there. points I want to make that aren't very related. Firstly, um, there was a talk about the Australian identity, and uh, I think um, Australia has a few very unique things, but one of the very unique aspects to our, our society is the Aboriginal culture. And in 30, well, by 2030, I'd like, to, I'd like to see that we embrace that and make that part of our culture, part of the mainstream culture. So you know, we have an idea of what is Aboriginal medicine mm. and, you know, when people come to visit us, we can show them and we can be proud of it like they are in New Zealand. Mm. Um, and the other thing I want to point out is um, that uh, there's, there's this cruelty that seems to run through our system of, you know, who can we keep out of this country, you know? So it was, you know, let's keep out all the blacks and all the coloureds and then... You know, let's keep out all the people with disabilities and, um, you know, whoever we don't like, we'll just keep them out. And um, so, you know, they got rid of the white Australia policy, but they still haven't got rid of the no disability policy. And we're still having um, a lot of trouble uh, getting people with disabilities and their family in Australia. And Eva, I'm really, I support you in your argument for this... Um, very strong and unnecessary emphasis on economics because um, a couple of years ago we were uh, writing the submission to the Joint Standing Committee on Migration arguing that people with disabilities, some of them may not be able to contribute economically but it's still their right to come to Australia with their family and, and um, not be isolated. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to argue on an economic level because you know, everyone comes back to you and says, well, they're going to be a cost to our community, a cost to our society, it's a burden, we've got a shortage of resources, we can't accommodate people yeah. with disabilities who are not going to contribute to our economy. Yeah. All right, but thank you. I'd like to give some other people a, uh, an opportunity, but thank you very much for your comment. Yes, right down the front here. Oh. Yell it out. Hello, I'm Tanya Cowell, I'm from Far North, far north Queensland, um, from, from Tolly. Um, the one thing for 2030 in, in the future, one of the main things got to change is, is the um, society in the federal and, and the, in the government side of things, and also the, the community. Because everyone, even though there's been a change, what, like what James says about when we stop at, at stop at a went past the um, the dog the dog dog on the on the the tucker box. Families don't. I my family used to do that when we were kids, but you don't you don't you don't see fam today. They cannot afford it. They can't not afford to go to places with their with their kids and explaining what they they done. You know. Hmm. And um, but not only that, but I got hit an intellectual disability that I was born with. And I've been left in the unknown for a number of years until I had a major car accident. And I found out by two dis disabilities because I've been labelled intellectual pain. But some old schools got to change their attitude about us, hmm. 
stop stop going in in the what the past what in the 50s and 60s start learning the, the disability of today how we live and where well, you can learn a lot more, lot more of us than going through and going back into the statistics yep. in the 50s and 60s 60s and that, that way we can live in a in the wider Australia. Mm. It would be a fantastic thing to see in 2030 that all were included <laughs> and all had opportunity. It's a, it's a fantastic <laughs> point. Just at the, uh, the back there, yes, you? Yep. Hmm? Off you go, yell it out. You're, they're they're going to mic you. you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you've got a lovely big voice. You could probably do it without that microphone. I'd like to see you try. Yes, but, uh, uh, it's a voice for... I've got a great face for radio. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> I know. Uh, <laughs> Graham Douglas Meyer, I'm actually from, I'm on the board of ACOS and uh, I'm also with the Australian Federal uh, Federation of Disability Organisations. Now, um, one of the things I would really like to see happen by 2030 is that Australia gets over this same-sex marriage problem. Aye. I'm sorry, it's about time we grew up. But beyond that, the, the, the idea that, uh, that Eva was putting forward about inclusion the fact that it's important that people do, do feel included within our society, but all we seem to be doing is marginalising smaller and smaller groups. Mm. And by the way, Adam, thanks for your work. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah I, I think what I, what, what I would really want to ask you is, where do you think we're going to be socially at that point in time? Mm. So some quick comments just to, to finish. On, uh, on uh, social things. Eva, you can go first. Well, I think, that's, I, mean, I think that's the crucial question, that unless we put society back on the agenda, we're likely to find ourselves ever more fragmented as we all chase after the dollar and growth and various other things in a very unpleasant manner. So I suppose I'm saying we have to start talking about social and we have to put it back on the political agenda. We have to move the economy down to paying for society rather than vice versa, and then we might actually have a good society by 2030. Rebecca? Oh, we'll have same-sex marriage before then. I mean, the only people that are really perturbed by it are, are fundamentalist Christians and people in Parliament. You know, they should just, <laughs> we should lock them up somewhere. I mean, in the broader community, it is an, it's a non-issue. People don't understand it. I think socially we'll see a lot happen in terms of gender inequality um, and potentially also in, in terms of um, the access of people from, from different kinds of... Um, from migrant backgrounds to Australia. The thing I despair about is, is Aboriginal Australia because it doesn't seem like time and money has done anything. And that's what... I, I would hate... I, th I've, I despair about the capacity for 30 years, things changing as dramatically as we would like. Mm. Adam? Uh, I would hope that equality more broadly is a centrepiece of political discussion in 2030. I'm, um, I said this at the start, but I'm worried about it slipping off the agenda. I think that um, equality is given way to, I think as Eva referred to, sort of an individualism where we all have to manage our own affairs and we stand or fall on how well we do that and that the role of government is just to create the framework for that. I think that's wrong. I think that there's a role for government in actually promoting equality, but it's a debate that slipped off the agenda. Um, so I hope it's, it's back there in 2030. Mm. Annabelle? Um, I think Rebecca's right about the same-sex marriage thing, um, but I wanted to mention that I think that by 2030 we will have started thinking less unevenly about um, health problems. Um, for instance, and this is something that I, I'm really proud of um, in Australian society in the last 10 years, and I think we'll get the rest of the way there in the next 30, is thinking of mental illness as an illness, not as a sort of weird curse that end, makes you end up being a suicide or an alcoholic, you know, that it's um, uh, an illness that can be treated and managed and cured like any other illness, and um, that's a really important objective, I think. George? Now, just to clarify, we've been, uh, Annabelle and I have been watching the Twitter feed from time to time while we've been Always. speaking, and it's, uh, all the comments are good except one, I think, but I think that's an outsider <laughs> now, who isn't in this room, but not an outsider that you'd want to include is probably the best way to put it. <laughs> now, <laughs> now you're going to have to tell us. Yeah, well, what yeah. is it? Yeah, what was it? Come on. Some, or is it rude? I better find it. Yeah. No, I'll find it in a sec. No, we can talk yeah. about it later. By 2030, um, you'll find Twitter's immediately. Mm. Yeah, but 20, by 2030... Now, 
Uh, Rebecca, I, I'm, I'm going to uh, give away a story here because I was going to write it, but I've, having scrawled it down, I'll write the column anyway later. But, uh, Not I if I write it first. No, you can write it first because you probably beat me to it. But um, You're going to give away my story. No, no, it's not your oh. story. I picked up something on what you've <laughs> said about, uh, the because uh, it's come out of your groups, so the reluctance of men to ask for uh, less hours. Now, we know, in fact, it's a bit of a revelation to when you frame it that way. The traditional reluctance is for women to ask for more money. Hence the pay gap, even though uh, pretty much up to about the age of 50 now, there are more women with tertiary education than men in the workforce. But we still have this 10 to 15 per cent pay gap for equivalent jobs, not just because of um, the hours worked. So by 2030, if men could work out how to ask, how to ask for, for less hours and women could work out how to ask for more money, you might start to solve a few other problems yeah, yeah. with it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, it's I'm been a terrific discussion. And Thanks, George. You're going to beat me to it. Very good. <laughs> it's, been a, um, it's been a terrific discussion. Uh, Fernando handed me a piece of paper and he said, uh, you know, maybe by uh, 2030 the New Start allowance, which hasn't been lifted since 1994, <laughs> maybe it might have been raised by 2030. So uh, that could be a good thing. Um, look, I think this has been great, you know, like a, like a, a, a good ride to the airport with an overeducated taxi driver. Um, <laughs> We've identified all the <coughs> potential and problems of Australia and we've come up with some terrific ideas to uh, fix them. So would you thank the, uh, the panel here this afternoon, Eva Cox, Rebecca Huntley, Adam Bant, Annabelle Crabb and George Melodinus. Thank you, George Melodinus. And thank you all for coming and all your terrific comments. Hope it's been a great conference for you and uh, see you again. Just also want to say, James, obviously thank you again to all the panellists, but James, you did just a brilliant job. We loved you. Thank you so much. Really superb. Uh, we love all the work that these people do. We love watching them. We love reading them. We love their tweeting. Um, and we have loved the discussion. I mean, this, this debate about the social and the economic. Um, last year, um, some of you might remember the opening of the ACOS conference, that there was a, a paper given where we said, you know, when we start to talk about putting a price on uh, child abuse before we do anything about it, I think we've really gone too far. Um, and also there's been some great research done that shows that actually if, what we want to do is change people's uh, minds, and the best way to do it is you don't give them rational arguments, you change the way they feel. So we need to talk more about relationships and love. Um, only, I think in the last um, election campaign, there was only one politician who used the term love. I nearly fell off my chair when he did it. It was Bob Brown. Um, and so also lifting the New Start allowance would be an act of love. So we are seriously at the end of the ACOS conference. Um, absolutely thrilled that you're all able to travel to be here. We want you to travel home very, very safely. Before you go, please can the ACOS conference organiser, Louise Stanley, stand up? Is she there? She's there at the back of the room. Please give her a very, very huge congratulations. Um, also, also Penny Josh, Marcy uh, Richards, Tessa Boyd Kane, Peter Davidson, um, and I just don't want to forget anybody. But the ACOS team, all the volunteers, thank you all for your great, great work. Of course, thank you to you in particular. I particularly want to thank people who shared your personal stories. It is always a way to bring us back to what really matters. Thank you so much. Travel safely and I hope you had a great conference.